Hello, welcome to AC 1002 Lecture 11. Uh, this is the second lecture in our look at uh, domestic floor construction. Some of the information that we're going to talk about here has been covered um, in some detail in Lecture 10, so um, if I skip past things, jump back to Lecture 10 and hopefully you should be able to, to, to pick up the um, what the materials are or, or, or what they're doing. So, when we're looking at a suspended ground floor, we're talking about a, a platform, a timber frame platform that sits above the, uh, the, the subfloor and creates a void beneath it. And we can use that void for putting uh, services in, we can uh, get access for maintaining our property, but primarily it's there for ventilation. So any moisture that's in that space um, coming up from the ground uh, or in, indeed coming through from uh, services or from the building is allowed to be carried away by, by air passing through there. In domestic buildings we tend to use timber and we'll be talking about timber framing this, uh, this module so we'll be looking at a timber frame example and the timber structure for a suspended floor will be sitting on to substructure walls or dwarf walls. Um, dwarf walls are effectively small substructure walls that support a floor mid-span. Beneath the, the timber suspended floor we usually have a, a surface. We've got something that we kind of look down onto that's the bottom surface of the subfloor void and um, in modern constructions that tends to be a thin layer of concrete um, which uh, we would refer to as oversight concrete. So we'll be looking at these aspects in, in this lecture. There are a number of benefits for a suspended ground floor. Um, it doesn't rely on, on concrete because it's, it's a timber construction. So it's not limited by cold. If you have concrete and there's a frost, the moisture within the concrete can freeze and can cause uh, damage to the concrete to the point where it has to be um, removed. But really the only limitation for a suspended ground floor is the safe working temperature for a joiner to work in. Um, suspended ground floors are also useful where the, the grounds may be um, uneven around the, the building or a sloped site. So we don't have to backfill with um, multiple layers of uh, hard core to be able to build up the solum because we can actually leave that space um, as uh, as a rectangular ventilated void below the, the, the floor. We also get a useful space for, for service runs. We can put pipes, water pipes, uh, drainage into there. We could put electrical services. The only proviso is that anything that goes into that space is on the cold side of the insulation so it would need to be uh, insulated itself so you would get lagging round, round pipes to be able to so stop it losing its heat or freezing. And I suppose you could argue that uh, using timber is, is more sustainable than, than concrete. Um, it's probably quicker. Um, it might be slightly cheaper as well. So with the, or as with the, the ground bearing floor, we need to get rid of all the vegetable matter underneath the building. We need to get rid of the topsoil that contains anything that can, can rot away. And we would probably uh, scrape that back down to a hard pan or um, a subsoil level to be able to get rid of all that material. And we can see in this example here the, the walls have been built up to uh, this at the top of the, the substructure and within each of those walls we can see the, the hard core that's been overlaid onto the, onto the top to form the base level, level of the solum and that would be compacted down in a similar way to the hardcore was for the, the ground bearing floor. In this image we've also got uh, a number of different things that we can see. Outside here we've got some um, we've got some uh, air bricks that pass through the wall and you'll see them on uh, the other side as well around about that point and that allows for um, air to, to move through that substructure and carry any moisture on the way out. And likewise between these dwarf walls there's also um, another series of gaps that allow this space to be 
uh, ventilated as one large um, subfloor void. So we've got our hard core laid over the top of the, the, the earth, compacted down, and our, as I mentioned before, in, in, in section it tends to be a kind of ziggy-zaggy pattern that you would use. And on top of that, because hard core can have sharp edges, we would need to blind the, 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 the top surface to be able to um, take away any of those, those sharp edges. And that's that's a 50 millimeter layer of sand. And onto the top of that, we would put our uh, damp proof membrane. And we can see in this image here, this is the, the, the next step is to put um, concrete over the top. The oversight concrete um, is, is there for a number of reasons. One, to uh, tidy off the, the, the surface of the, the solum and give a solid surface, uh, which is slightly more impervious to moisture. It also stops any plants which may be uh, rooted underneath the, the, the solum from breaking through. Um, and we can shape it in certain ways to be able to direct any moisture that's within the, the, the subfloor void to, to run out if it can't be carried by the, by the air passing through. It doesn't need to be reinforced. It's just 50 millimetres of concrete, so that's two inches of concrete. Um, we're not going to be standing on it, we're not going to be putting any um, weight onto it, partitions or such, so really it's just there to, to um, tidy off the, the subfloor and prevent any growing through it. We can see on this image here we've got this edge of blue running around here and here, and that's our DPM which has been laid over the top of the sand before the concrete, and it's, uh, it's sort of lapped up the edge of the, the, the walls and then the concrete's poured into it and we've got our air bricks visible to the outside there to provide us with a, a cross flow of, of air. So that makes up our, our solum, that's the, the base level of the, the ground floor. Next we need to think about the, the level that we're actually going to stand on. Um, before we get to that point we've got to think about what happens if the solum fills up with water. So if you imagine you had a, a floor and there was a flood um, and that whole area underneath the floor uh, could fill up with water. If the ground level was too high on the outside then it, it may, may stay there permanently and cause damage to the building. So we always need to be able to build the solum so it's higher than the outside level of the, the ground and that allows for moisture to to, to drain away or water to drain away. Um, if that's not possible, if it's a sloped site um, or, or a difficult site, then we can put a sump drain somewhere in the middle of the, the, the plan within the solum to be able to take any moisture away. So the layer that we, we need to, to stand on effectively becomes the bottom layer of our platform frame. We've got uh, joists which um, I suppose are a series of closely spaced timber beams um, and you can see in this image they're, they're joined over the top of the, uh, the substructure walls so there's actually a wall running uh, along this point here um, which goes right the way underneath there and that's our little dwarf wall and over the top of that we've got joists which span over this way and these ones happen to be um, patched fit together so there's there's two joists and then there's a plate that covers them that that joins them together and then to keep them a set distance apart we have um, blocking between them so that's that's really just to reinforce it like the rungs of a ladder so our joists tend to be 400 to 600 millimeters apart and that's related to the the standard size of building materials being um, four feet by eight feet which is 1200 by 2400 and sizes like like 400 300 and 600 tend to be divisions of that so it's very easy to cut large materials to be able to to fit onto uh, spacings like this so there's not a, a, um, a kind of wastage of material the height between the top of the solum and the underside of the joist is is important and there's a minimum size of 150 millimeters 
to make sure that we can get some air passing through that space and there's adequate volume of air moving through to be able to, to ventilate the subfloor. The next thing we have to think about within our construction is um, how we keep ourselves warm. Obviously, if there's air moving through the subfloor void, then it's going to be more or less outdoor air temperature. So we have to be able to put something into the, the floor construction that keeps us warm. And the, the normal way of doing that is to fit some sort of insulation material. So this can be um, either rigid sheet material, uh, flexible bats, blankets or loose material. Um, sometimes it's easier to use something like mineral wool as shown in this image here because it's easy to be able to fit in there, it can squeeze down, it fills all the voids uh, and there's, there's no gaps. But we need to make sure it doesn't fall through. In the top image here we can see there's a, there's a kind of mesh there. And the purpose of that mesh is to be able to support the insulation. So we can either staple mesh to the underside of joists or we can wrap it around the top and, and, and form pockets for the insulation to, to, be, to be placed into. So once we've got our mesh in place, the next step would be to put our insulation in place. And effectively that starts to complete the, the insulation envelope of the building. And as we saw in earlier slides, the, the air bricks on the outside um, are there to allow for, for ventilation. So we need to build them into to the outside leaf and the inside leaf. And you'll probably have seen on buildings these um, these air bricks with the, the little uh, mesh of, of, of holes going through it. And they're placed at opposite sides of, of a building so that the wind blows across the building and it pushes air through that uh, air brick and out the other side. And that air can then carry any moisture that's within that space. There's a minimum size for, for um for air bricks and it's uh, 1500 millimeter squared for each linear meter of wall. 1500 millimeter squared sounds enormous, but it's actually a tiny size. Um, it's square millimeters rather than square meters or anything. So don't, don't worry about that. So you can either do it 1500 millimeters for each linear meter of wall, wall or 500 millimeters for each square meter of floor area. So you can um, do a calculation depending on which, which one is, uh, which one fits best. So that would have to pass through both leaves. We would have the, the outer leaf, which is the, the finish that we would see. And then the inner leaf is the one that's going to support the, the, the kit. So we can see here, there's the, the kind of the edge detail. We've got our, um, solemn sitting down at this level. It's, uh, higher than the outside ground level. Uh, we have our air brick to allow air to carry moisture away and and then at this point we we start our our timber kit so there'll be a, a dpc sitting in there we've got a, a sole plate we've got a number of header joists floor joists spanning away and then our timber kit works its way up to the thing sorry it's horrible drawn with a mouse by the way so that's, that's the kind of edge construction in a very simplified way. There are details available, um, and I'll put a link on the Moodle page to the Scottish accredited details, and you can have a look at, uh, at how they work. Um, but that's one of their details. So it's, it shows more or less the same thing. I've missed out a few bits and pieces to, to simplify things, but we've got our, our solum with damp proof membrane, we've got, we've got air bricks, we've got external ground level, um, and uh, our insulation supported onto, onto netting. Um, so, in conclusion, a uh, suspended floor is built a similar way to the platform floor, platform frame. So it's effectively the lowest platform of a platform frame. It relies on substructure walls and dwarf, dwarf walls for support, and the void underneath is useful, but needs to be of an adequate size to perform its core function, which is ventilation. So a suspended floor is useful where the ground level might vary, where a lightweight timber floor is required and it needs to rest on the, the external walls. And there's a need for a service void below a floor. If we are not factoring in thermal mass as part of our heating strategy, then uh, a, a suspended timber floor would, would work well. 
Okay, thanks very much for listening. Um, there'll be following lectures on uh, other elements of construction, mostly to do with uh, walls and roof and the layers of material. Okay, thank you.